every nation must be saved. When I is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Upon the world 
is the great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand Stronger in the presence of 
God, you have called us each by name. You've handpicked us out of thousands on our campus to lead us where no man wants to go, but where your spirit wants to go. You've brought us here to mold us and to shape us, to become the men and women that you're calling us to be. Father, I, I pray that you lead us to where we don't want to go, but where you are leading us is where you want us to be. In spite of all our fears, our failures, our insecurities, you help us to fix our hearts and our eyes upon your grace and upon your Son. You have blessed our lives with more than 10,000 reasons to be devoted, to give the very best of what we have, to give you the best of our time, our talents, our dreams, to you and for your kingdom. God, thank you for bringing us from L.A. to New York, from Denver to Chicago, to be here in this room, to dream new dreams, to see your visions, for you to lead us. God, you've given us friends we don't deserve, families that we don't deserve, a peace, a purpose that so many people long for. You've given us blessing after blessing. And it's only through your Son do we get these blessings. Bless the Lord, all my soul, for the incredible, wondrous things you've done for me and for everybody in this room. I pray we can get in touch with your Spirit, that we can feel you moving, that we can connect with you in worship, that your Word cuts our hearts today as we hear it preached. Your son is the only reason why this is possible. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, the captain. It is he that we follow, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to see.
on the tablet of your heart then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and of man trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight
dancing with my hand wide open. I will find this mountain with my hands wide open. Father, we are so grateful for who it is that you are. God, you are amazing. Your love is incredible. And Father, we stand here humbly, kneeling to you in our hearts. Father, with all of the philosophies and all of the knowledge that there is in the world, God, we want to put those things to the side. Father, there's nothing else that we want to hold on to other than your word, other than your truth, other than your love. God, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to release us from the foolishness of the world. And God, thank you for placing us in the heavenly realms with your son. God, we're so grateful and we just ask that this is a time where we would re-up our commitment where we would make it our mission to lean on you and only on you. Father, take our fellowship with one another deeper. God, take our passion for your mission deeper and help our likeness of Christ to be deeper. We love you and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The next song we sing is called Deeper. It may be new to some. What we're gonna do is go through the parts one by one, starting with the bass, then the tenor, then the alto, then the soprano, so we can learn it together. Let's start with the bass. Here we go, let's sing out. I 
Jason, and this is my wife Justine. We are a part of Gateway City Campus Ministry right here in STL. We've been preparing for you literally for years, like three years. We've been planning and preparing for and imagining your presence here. So welcome, welcome to St. Louis. So, yes. So I hope uh, this conference this weekend has a profound impact on you. We live in a culture that conditions us to send every experience and every desire through the filter of what can I get out of it? And, and that consumer culture shapes us. Without us realizing, it shapes our desires. It teaches us what to aim for. There's power in that. But this weekend, this weekend, there's power in this weekend as well. Just by being in the presence of thousands, I think it's 18,000 people. 
18,000 people, all of them love God. And by soaking ourselves in scripture and in worship and in song and in prayer and in fellowship and in sermons and in teaching, well, that also has power to shape us. So here's the thing. I encourage you, don't worry about what you may or may not get out of this weekend. I encourage you to give your whole self to it. Give your entire being. For those of you who don't do well with crowds, may, I'm not sure what your expectation is for yourself, but bump it up. Meet, meet new people. Explore, engage in, in new ways with people. Give your whole self to this weekend, because by doing so, we'll be on our way to learning what to aim for. Yeah. Okay, so welcome, yes. Uh, so this is my wife, and she is also your conference planner. So, we say the word reach in our household probably like 5,000 times a day for like the last three years. So, um, uh, but she's got some uh, stuff for you guys to know so you can know what's happening this weekend, yeah? Welcome. It's a pleasure to have all of you with us. We've been looking forward to this day. This is very special to us, especially the ICMC. You'll learn a lot about the schedule, but the most important thing is that you download the app, Reach Summit. So go to the App Store, Android Store, and download the app if you haven't already. Your campus students, your tech savvy, I'm sure you probably already have. You will need your confirmation that's also on the back of your lanyard to download the app. Everything that you possibly want to know from classes, choosing your classes, fun things, things going on in the city, it's all on the app. So reach Summit. Please download it for all the exciting information. A couple of things that we've specially done for campus students is we called it on the app tonight from 8 to 11 in Hall 2 here in the America Center. We have a mixer. For you young folks, that's actually a dance. Woo! It's going to be awesome. So tonight, 8 to 11 in Hall 2, come to the dance. Hall 2 also during the daytime has food and concessions. They'll have some tonight too. So if you're a little tight on your schedule, you can grab something to eat at the dance tonight. In addition to that, for campus students, you know, some of us are on a budget, right? So <laughs> we said we want to have fun and we want to eat good. We want to show you some good St. Louis food. So we've opened this up to everybody, but it truly was with the ICMC in mind. So we are having an event on Friday and Saturday from lunchtime up until 5 o'clock. So you can go there for lunch or before the evening session. We're calling it Holy Smokes. And it is a barbecue cook-off. We're going to have 12 different barbecue companies cooking all different styles of barbecue. We're going to have ice cream, all kinds of fun things. It's really inexpensive, and it's going to be amazing. So Friday or Saturday, please go there. I actually have, since we're on a budget, two $25 gift certificates for Holy Smokes to give away. So the first person who can get on the Reach Summit app, find that information, and post it in the activity feed, Actually, the first two people will give you each a $25 gift certificate. So go, Holy Smokes Barbecue. While you guys are looking, I'm just going to mention one other thing about your lanyard and the Metrolink. Your lanyard will get you to go anywhere in the city. You can take the train, you can take the bus, you can take the trolley, and it's all complimentary for anybody with the lanyard. On Saturday, Forest Park, which is actually busier than Central Park, the Metrolink has set up more trolleys at Forest Park, so you can hop on the Metrolink, go down to Forest Park, you can go to the zoo, all types of museums, it's a beautiful place to be. So you can do that Saturday included as well. Has anybody found it and posted it? All right, it's, we'll find it, it's coming up here. Are you sure? 
Raise your hand if you found it and posted it. Okay, so after this, we'll make sure the first two people will have your names because your profile is in there. We'll get you your gift certificates. What you'll want to do, actually, if you're the first two, it'll be in line on there. Stop at the Gateway Trading Store in the Plaza Lobby because that's where you can get all your really cool reach gear. And you'll, we'll have a $25 gift certificate for each of you. So lots of other fun things, but I just wanted to highlight a couple things. We're so excited to have you with us. Please enjoy ICMC and Reach. Great to have you. Let's pray, actually. God, we're grateful for life. We're grateful that you fill our lungs with breath, that you wake us each morning from our sleep and bring us out into your world, uh, not uh, to be aimless or without purpose, but to glorify your name, God. Uh, we, uh, we offer this uh, whole weekend to you, God. We pray that you will be uh, lifted up, that your name will be larger than all names in our imaginations, and that we could take that home, especially for us as uh, college uh, ministries, th that you would uh, use what you do here to change lives back home. Uh, to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <laughs> My youth corps in 2010 was actually during Christmas week in Chennai, India. My life was radically changed. And it was not because of what I gave to the community, but it was more of what the families gave me. You know, don't think of a Hope Youth Corps as a time to have a temporary effect or temporary fix in someone's life. It's something that will literally flip the way you view serving people, the way you view gratitude, even just the way you view yourself, so that you can help others a lot more down the road. Um, ever since then, I just feel like Serving that summer has instilled that love, the love of Jesus in my heart, just to be able to care about people, um, to look for other people's needs above my own, and I feel like Youth Corps and Hope really gave me that. Hope Youth Corps is really an international program. Take, for example, the Hope Youth Corps in 2013 in Chennai. They actually had 12 different nations represented on that youth school. On the behalf of Hope Worldwide, I just want to say a huge thank you to all the churches and all the parents who supported the Hope Youth Corps around the world. Youth Corps! <laughs> Go to Nepal and serve. Go to the Philippines and serve. Go beyond your comfort zone. Go somewhere that's different, where the food's different, the people speak a different language and serve. Become the servant leader that God intended you to be. What will you do on Hope Youth Core? Well, Hope Youth Core, first of all, is not just for teens. And actually, our international programs are specifically designed for campus students. Yes, you will serve. Yes, you will build homes. Yes, you will serve in communities. You will teach children. You will plant community gardens. But more than that, you will have daily devotionals, daily discipleship groups. You will share your faith, and you will preach the word. Hope Youth Core is the whole gospel. 
is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hope you score can change your spiritual DNA and make you the servant leader God intended you to be. You will serve with people from all over the world you've never even met before. Talk about uncomfortable. This year we have programs over Christmas. What better Christmas present can you get? Go on Hope Youth Corps. We have spots on the Hope Youth Corps in the Philippines, in Thailand, and in Nepal. Next year, we're going to New Zealand, St. Petersburg, Russia, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Bolivia. Want to come? Want to join us? We need you, and we especially need brothers. Brothers, we need your leadership on these youth, cor youth cores. I will now hand over to Eric, who is one of our Hope Youth Corps interns. We have, um, we have an internship program tied to Hope Youth Corps, the Global Service Internship. We have 20 interns who lead their own Hope Youth Corps. Eric has just literally come back this minute from the Chicago Hope Youth Corps, which he which he designed himself and led. Here's Eric. Awesome, what's going on guys? We just got back from our uh, Chicago Youth Corps. She mentioned it was my dream to have one back in Chicago, so it was incredible being able to be a part of it and to organize it. Uh, my favorite thing about Youth Corps is the adventure you have at Hope Youth Corps because Jesus lived an adventurous life, didn't he? I mean, with Jesus, you never knew what was gonna happen next. Right? He, was, he was a manly man. He had a lot of grit. And in youth corps, it's the same. You don't know what's going to happen next on youth corps. You could be serving the poor. You could be going to a community center to mentor. You could be sharing your faith. And then, oh yeah, then breakfast. You do all that, and then you repeat for lunch and just keep it going. On top of the awesome adventure you get with youth corps, there's also incredible ministry training. I know today I would not be in campus ministry or in ministry at all, if, ex if not for my experience with Youth Corps. You know, I wanna break things down a little bit for you guys here, is that cool? All right, you get four summers in campus. Okay, you get five to seven for some of you guys working on your, your uh, campus eldership. Let's be real, but we'll talk about that later. All right, so you get four, you get four summers. I wanna encourage you guys to use one of those summers, at least one of them, to, to go and serve the poor and to share your faith and to practice Jesus' full ministry. Join the adventure that is Youth Corps next year. It's gonna be lit, my G. Let me just tell you how inspired I am to be up here. My name is Jameson Malcolm, and I've been a part of campus ministries in our fellowship for the last 14 years. Y'all can't get rid of me. I was converted at University of Georgia, was in Philadelphia there at, uh, in the campus ministry, and now we lead the church at Penn State University. And the reason I love campus ministry is because when you convert someone, when you baptize someone at this stage of life, you're changing the entire trajectory of their lives. And they become anchored in the kingdom of God, and they marry disciples, and their children grow up in the church. And we get to change generations because of the work that goes on right here. But I want to take it way back if possible. About 3,000 years, we're going to go in the Old Testament, you don't have to turn there, just listen. Samaria is being sieged by the Arameans. And the people in Samaria are literally starving to death. They are dying. And there are people outside who are lepers. They're not allowed inside the walls. And God, through his grace, scares the Aramean army away and they run off. And the lepers go to the camp and I just want to read you their experience. It says in verse 8, the men who had leprosy reached the edge of the empty camp. They entered one of the tents and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned 
and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. As I look out, I am so inspired to be in this room. And it's amazing to be surrounded by so many faithful people. But let us never hide what God has given us. God has given us amazing experiences, incredible people in our lives, amazing churches, but there's a world that is literally starving to death, clouded in darkness, and they need us to go. I'm here representing the One Year Challenge. The One Year Challenge is a program of the ICOC Campus Ministries where you are sent out all over the world. And the slides that you're seeing now are One Year Challenge participants who are building up churches all over the world, who are baptizing people all over the world, who are changing lives and destinies all over the world. And next year, it's gonna be some of you in these pictures. Next year, it's gonna be some of you who are sharing at the One Year Challenge Mixer about what God has done in your lives. I want each one of you to pray before noon tomorrow, to just simply pray that God would send workers into the harvest field. I don't want anybody to feel guilty for not being on the one-year challenge. I don't want you to feel like you have to go. I do want you to pray that God would send workers in the harvest field and simply see what God does in your life. And I want it to be before noon tomorrow because at noon tomorrow, we're having our one-year challenge mixer. And I want you guys to be there. And you can meet one-year challenge site leaders from literally all over the world. You can check your apps to see the room and time. We're gonna be in the Hyatt in Hall A and B. And you're gonna be able to meet people who have uh, done the one-year challenge in the past year or two and hear their experiences and all the ways that God has changed their lives and used them. I wanna challenge you between now and then. Pray for the one-year challenge. Pray that God would send workers into the harvest field. Thank you. Hopefully my mic turns on, there we go. Uh, hey, before we begin, this is the time when we talk about the state of the campus. I wanna tell you what's going on in campus and where we're going, but before we do that, take out your phones for a second. And uh, we are trying to increase some of our media profiles. I want you to go to Facebook, and in the search, I want you to search ICOC Campus Ministry. And when you get there, I want you to just simply like it. And if you like it, that means that uh, you'll get news about what's going on in the campus ministry from month to month. And when you're done with that, I want you to go to Instagram and go to ICOC Campus and like that as well. And then you will get news both from Instagram and from Facebook about what's going on in the campus ministry. Now every year we spend a little bit of time at the ICMC updating what's going on in the entirety of the U.S. campus ministries. But before I begin, I want to tell you a story. You know, when I was a student at UMass Amherst... Um, my campus minister was a guy named Chip Mitchell. And Chip Mitchell now leads the Philadelphia Church, and he's going to be speaking at a keynote during the, uh, during the conference on Friday night. But our leaders' meetings, I used to go into our leaders' meetings terrified of what uh, Chip would say and what we'd do in the leaders' meetings. And sometimes Chip would tell us to go to campus to go door knocking on campus on Saturday mornings. He would specifically send us to frat row. And so we would go up and down the frat. 8 a.m., 9 a.m., Saturday morning, door knocking and inviting people to church. Nobody on frat row was awake on Saturday morning. We would have to wake them up so that we could invite them to church. And the thing is, you know, it never occurred to us to ask the question, is this effective or not? Because to us, it was a spiritual issue. Either God would move or it wouldn't be time for him to move. But by faith, we believed God could do something. You know, looking back at what we did 20 years ago, I'm proud of those moments. 
Something more than knocking on doors was happening those mornings. We were being made into something. Those moments of faith had nothing to do with being relative or with public polling or with researched methodology. Instead, we were aligning ourselves with the most improbable calling, one that promised that impregnable walls could be destroyed by people blowing on horns, one that promised that suns could be frozen in the sky simply by raising your arms up to pray, and one that swore that giants could be slain by the dreams and idealism of youth, even if only armed with slings and with stones. On those Saturday mornings, I was becoming the man I hoped God would make me become. I hope my sons have the thrill of having a campus minister like Chip Mitchell, someone that expects them to do the impossible with the full expectation of the improbable happening. I hope we're all willing to raise up leaders like that, and I hope that we're all willing to be leaders like that. The campus ministry has, for decades, been at the heart of the evangelistic push in the United States. The American University is for us the locus of idealism and potential that our mission badly needs. Furthermore, it's perhaps the last vestige of adult innocence anywhere in our country. It is the perfect time and place for the word of God to take root. It is during these formative years that paradigms are challenged, that old belief systems are upturned, where truth awakens in full within young men and women. An anthology of our movements, of our movement's greatest narratives will most often be taking place within a campus ministry. Where young men and women stand up in classrooms of 300 people and share their faith. Where Bible studies happen in dorm rooms, in cafeterias, in lounges, empty classrooms. Student unions are pretty much anywhere where you don't have to buy something. <laughs> where being asked to be a Bible talk leader is still considered a great honor and a position of distinction. Where the idea of roaming the world as a homeless vagabond is a dream and not a nightmare. As long as you get to preach the word when you do it. Where at a conference, their mere mention of your school, of your city, will elicit screams of joy and familiar pride from anyone from that ministry. Am I right, Chicago? We're being asked to do a communion at church has the same import as being asked to address Congress itself. The desire to change the world never dies in the campus ministry. It never fades in the campus ministry. It burns fierce and it leaves its mark on everyone who passes through. First Chronicles 12.8 says this, some Gadites defected to David and his stronghold in the wilderness. They were brave warriors ready for battle and able to handle shield and spear. Their faces were the faces of lions, and they were as swift as gazelles in the mountains. Verse 14 says, these Gadites were army commanders. The least was the match for a hundred, and the greatest for a thousand. It was they who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it was overflowing at its banks. And they put to flight everyone living in the valleys, to the east and to the west. The spirit of the Gadites is the spirit of the campus ministry. Point us in any direction and we will cover the ground with the fruit of the spirits. And we will do it with noise and we will do it with laughter and we will do it with carefree abandon. Now that is the campus ministry I love and the one I hope never fades from our movement. Yet group personality is always going to be driven by its cultural placeholders. What makes us who we are is largely determined by what we choose to value. The campus ministry at its best and the campus ministry that our fellowship desperately needs is one that has always excelled in two specific areas. One, we baptize a lot of people. And secondly, we raise up the next generation's leaders. Do not let the sun go down on your campus ministry days without embracing the call that is so roundly sounded from our movement, grow and train. So how are we doing in the U.S. campus ministries with our commission to grow and to train? Well, first of all, we are 3,750 students last year at the ICMC. This year we had 1,030 baptisms within those campus ministries.
We grew at a rate of 20% and we are on over 525 different universities in this country alone. In many ways, we are definitely fulfilling our commission to grow. But I think we can do better. I think we could do more. And I want to talk about the North River Campus Ministry just for a second. The North River Campus Ministry had 70 baptisms this year. You know, it used to be every year, every single year, we'd have to endure Tom Brown telling us that back in his day, campus ministries used to baptize 100 people. And by God, he's going to build another one that does it this year. And here's the thing about the North River. Out of those 70 baptisms, 50 of them were freshmen. And this is the thing I want to talk about. In three years, those 50 students will have three years of training and experience that may translate into the, one of the richest graduations of leaders we've seen in a long time coming from any campus ministry. All the campus ministers in here should be rethinking new strategies to imitate, imitate the North River and the baptism of many freshmen. This year, our campus ministry should be planning on achieving two goals. The first one we laid out last year, and this has a lot to do with the fact that every year we graduate a lot of people from our campus ministry. Hopefully one in four, realistically one in five. But at least 20% of our campus ministry is exiting every single year. So in order for our campuses to grow, we have to baptize at a rate of three, uh, uh, one baptism for every three members, for a three to one ratio. I want to put that before you again. In your campus ministry, you have got to strive to get one baptism for every three members. And if we can do that as a whole in the U.S., our campus ministries can, can, can continue to grow. The other one is this, is that I want us to refocus our efforts in converting freshmen at our universities. We need leadership like never before in our fellowships of churches. We need people to be in the campus ministry for a long time so that we can train them. So let's redouble our effort to reach the freshmen. Now, how are we doing raising up leaders that are ready to serve within our churches after they graduate? You know, I've had the worst case of writer's block this week that I've had in many years. Is I've considered how to write about this specific issue and what we need to do as a campus ministry. Right now, we have more need in the fellowship of graduating campus men and women to go into the ministry and to go abroad on mission teams than we have graduating leaders that are willing or competent to do so. And the need within our churches is only growing. You know, during this REACH conference, not just the ICMC, but tonight and tomorrow night, when you're a part of the larger conference, you are going to hear a significant, a significant initiative to re-engage our U.S. churches in global missions. The call will begin going out for disciples to drop their nets and to leave their homes and to go abroad. A new wave of U.S. missionaries is going to be sent out over the next couple years. This year alone, we've sent students, students to Paris, Lyon, Belgium, Geneva, Kiev, Ghana, Costa Rica, Johannesburg, London, Milan, Budapest, India, Brazil, Ecuador, just to name a few. Those are the people that we're sending as they're still students. I get multiple calls every week asking to see if I have a man or if I have a woman that is willing and able to do a one-year challenge here or there, or be an intern over there, or go into the full-time ministry somewhere else, and now we are being able to also prepare you to go abroad as missionaries. And perhaps for that reason, my writer's block this week has happened, because I don't think that we're yet ready for these realities. I think many students are hungry for the romance and the fantasy of these sacrifices, but may not be ready for the sacrifices and the realities of them. Because the realities of this type are hard ones. We need students who are willing, just as willing to go to Turkey and Iraq as they are to go to Paris and London. Furthermore, we need them to do it for free. As a matter of fact, we need you to raise money so that you can pay to do it. This kind of work is lonely and breathtaking in its scope. You know, the most evangelized place in the world is the Bahamas, where we have one disciple for every 5,000 people. In Europe, we have one disciple for every 500,000 people. The work before us is staggering. There are places where it's even worse than this. The work that we will be asked, that will be asked of this campus ministry requires a certain kind of toughness, a certain kind of grit, a certain kind of faith in Jesus that is raw. We need leaders that have these qualities. 
a kind that does not ma- measure its value by the number of likes they get by some touchy-feely or pseudo-revolutionary socio-political post that they make on Facebook. Right now, we have to raise up leaders who aren't concerned whether the world approves, disapproves, or likes our mission. The world is never, ever going to like us. So there is no reason to give another thought to the phony outrage directed at what we believe or how we choose to live. We need leaders who care enough about the people in this world not to care about what the people in this world think about them. We need explorers, we need inventors, and we need heroes whose call to save the world is completely unhinged from the adoration of this fallen people and fully yoked instead with Jesus Christ. We need you to be willing to leave the security of your homes. We need you to be willing to abandon the expectations of promising secular careers to be poor and go in the missionary, to, go, to be a missionary and to go in the ministry. We need you to be servants even as the world beckons you to become masters. We need you to be willing to do the dangerous work in at-risk communities. We need you to go down to Frat Row early on Saturday morning and go door knocking. And if they don't answer the door, we need you to kick it in. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Well, my name is Stuart Maines, and I'm in the L.A. campus ministry. Are y'all still awake out there? Are y'all still awake out there? Because I know there's a lot of different things going on, but we're at the ICMC. And I have the privilege of being able to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight. Amen. Now, we're going to hear tonight from Jesse Goldman. Jesse Goldman, along with his wife, Alexandra, they lead the campus ministry in Boston. Any Bostonians? You know, anybody that knows Jesse knows that he's a zealot. You know, he's one of our generation's greatest campus ministers. And he's definitely the best-looking campus minister that we got. Without a doubt. He's a phenomenal minister of God's word, but he's an incredible disciple as well. He doesn't just preach it, but he walks it. And he's been an incredible example to me and my wife. You know, I met Jesse at the World Discipleship Summit in 2012. We had the honor of being able to speak together. And that was the first time we ever met. And from that time on, we've been best friends. He is my best friend. And I love you with all my heart, brother. You have been with me through some of the darkest times I've ever had in the ministry. And the way that you've loved me and my wife and my family, your faithfulness, despite all the different things going on, you are always that bright light. You're a beacon for our family. We love you so much. Alexandra, you've been phenomenal. You're so incredibly encouraging to my wife and to me. And we've loved our times to be able to go on a cruise together, the four of us, amen. But we love you guys so, so very much. I want you guys to take out your pens. I want you to take out some paper because you're gonna need to take some notes because Jesse Goldman is about to write this sucker on your heart, amen? Let's stand up, let's sing Men Who Dream and then let's hear from Jesse Goldman.
right here. Thanks, brother. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, it's good to be with you right now. Man, I remember sitting right in your seats just a couple of years ago. I feel so privileged to preach the word to you here today. You know, my beautiful wife, Alexandra, and I, we, we love leading in the Boston campus ministry, and, and we're happy to be with all of you here today. Yeah, it's been, it's been two years since most of us have been together, and it's incredible to be back together, isn't it? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about what has been going on the last two years since a lot of us have seen each other. You know, things happen every day in our lives. Things happen in our, our country. Things happen all across the world. That can be very, very troubling. You know, the truth is, I think we live in very troubling times. We got presidential candidates that nobody likes. You know what I'm saying? There's controversy. People are troubled by it. I think about, a, you know, last year and all the racial tensions there were. People are troubled. There are riots. I think about this past year and all the terrorism that's been going on in our country and, and all over the world. And, and can't all that stuff just become very distracting? Can't all that stuff just become very confusing? And I don't know what you think as a young person, as a college student, but, but it can be that way. I think sometimes we need to be reminded of what matters most. You know, there are many times in my life that I thought I knew what really mattered most. When I was a young boy, I thought that I wanted to be a backstreet boy. <laughs> I did. I did. I thought that. I even took the CD cover to the hair salon. I said, you need to make my hair look exactly like that right there. And so I got the bathing cap on my head and I got what we used to call frosted tips. You guys know what that is? Do you guys want to see a picture of me with the frosted tips? No, you can't see that. I burned all those photos. I'm not showing you that. You know, at that time, at that time I thought it was looking good and what mattered most in life. I remember being a teenager and I bought a, a pair of pants that were really cool back in my day. And they were called snap-ups. And they were these and one pants. You, they don't, you guys don't even know what and one is. It doesn't even exist anymore, I don't think. And it had buttons going all the way up the side. And I remember buying a pair of those. And I mean, I was strutting through school. You know, I was walking. I was strutting. I was leaning. And, and I was standing there in front of my whole class as I walked into class. And this guy named Joe Dion came up behind me. And he straight up pants me in front of the whole class. <laughs> Yet, to his and my surprise, like a magician trick, they snapped and they came right off of me. And I was standing there in front of the whole class in my tidy whities You know, that's not a moment you want to be in right there. I thought at that time in life that it was being cool that mattered most. Are you with me? When I got to college, I decided I wanted to be a dentist. I don't know why people laugh whenever I say that, but that, that's what I thought. I th you know, I thought dentists, they make a lot of money, and they get to choose their own hours. That's got my name written all over it. And, but, not, but then I took genetics. Then I took genetics class, and that absolutely wiped the floor with me. And so I tried to retake it, and somehow I did worse the second time around in genetics than the first time. I didn't know it was possible, but, you know, I make the impossible possible, I guess. At that time, I thought maybe making money, having a sweet career. I thought maybe that is what mattered most in life. But then one day, I heard my campus minister, Kevin Miller, talk about changing the world. I heard him talking about having eternal impact. And I tried it out. And I helped somebody to become a Christian. And it was then that I realized what truly mattered most. You know, it didn't really matter what job I chose. 
It didn't really matter what major I chose, what career path I took. No matter where I went in life, my true purpose was to make disciples. That's what matters most. You know, in 1 Timothy, God says that he wants all men to be saved, and he wants all men to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so today, my sermon is simply entitled, Reach Everyone. Reach Everyone. Because this is our purpose. I don't know if you knew that. Maybe you forgot, maybe you didn't really know yet. But our purpose as disciples is to reach everyone. You know, when you read the book of Acts, it's incredible to see that, that the first century church, they were really a church that was reaching everyone. Now I want to show you guys a slide here with a couple snapshots from the book of Acts. Can we get that up there? You know, when you look at the book of Acts, it, in Acts chapter 2, it talks about how God was adding every day, daily, those who were being saved. Every single day, more people were being reached. You know, a little while later in Acts chapter 4, it talks about how just the number of men in the church in Jerusalem, it could be 5,000. So more time passes. And I, I love Acts 5. It, it talks about how all the believers would meet in Solomon's colonnade. And people were a little bit afraid of the church. It said nobody dared join them. But even though nobody would dare join them, it says nevertheless, more and more men and women believed and were added to their number. I mean, they were reaching everyone. By the time you get to Acts chapter 17, the church and the disciples in the church, they're described as people who have turned the world upside down. And so we gather here together as disciples on campus, kicking off another discipleship summit. And as we gather together, I wonder if we're going to do the same thing in our lifetime. I think about it. I wonder that. So I guess the question is, how did they do it in the Bible? How did the first century church do what we read that they did? We're going to look at, we're going to look at them. We're going to study out the first century church today. We're going to look at the book of Acts. If we're going to be disciples who reach everyone, we got to look at them. We got to learn how they did it. My first point for you is hearts on fire. When you read the Bible, the Christians in the first century church, their hearts were on fire for Jesus. Look what it says in, in Jeremiah chapter 20. It says, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. You see, this right here, this is what men and women of God in the Bible were like. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Let's read about Peter and John right here. You know, it's incredible. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, they go into the temple courts and they start preaching the word in the temple courts. Now, why might that be a bad idea? Because that's where the Pharisees hung out. You know, if you had just seen Jesus crucified not too long earlier, you might think, let's stay away from the temple courts. Let's not go preach the word there. But they did it anyways. And they heal a man. And they start preaching the word after they heal this man. And they get in trouble. And the guards come and they take them and they throw them in prison. You gotta ask yourself, what might you be acting like after a night in jail? After you had seen your Lord and Savior spend one night in jail and then get crucified the next day? What might you think your fate was gonna be if you're in their shoes? Where would your heart be at in this moment? Let's read together, starting in verse 5. It says, the next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of shyness, kindness shown to a man who is lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. I mean, you got to love the way that Peter cuts right to the chase. You know what I mean? They're kind of just beginning the questioning process. They ask him about this crippled guy, and Peter goes, I know why we're really here. Let, let's just cut right to the chase. We're here because we believe in Jesus. And he starts preaching the word at these guys. He goes on to verse 11. He tells them, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And he raises the stakes. And he says, you know what? Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then confer together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. You see, that's what it looks like when your heart's on fire for Jesus. People look at it and they go, what, what are we going to do with these people? It's inspiring. It's passionate. It's bursting out of you. you go, what are we going to do with these guys? You see, everybody living in Jerusalem knows they performed a notable sign. We can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach it all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. That right there, that's what it looks like when your heart's on fire for Jesus. There are too many Christians who do things because they're told to. Because they feel like they have to. And when you do that, you know, Jesus, he just becomes a routine in your life. Jesus just becomes a religion instead of your greatest love and your greatest passion. So you got to ask yourself, where is your heart at? What is your greatest love? When you look at Peter and John, it's pretty clear what mattered most to them and what their greatest love was. It was Jesus. Because the truth is, you will never reach anyone. You can never reach anybody else. If Jesus is just religion and routine to you, you got to choose. You got to choose. You know, we hit moments sometimes, like Peter and John hit right here. Right? Where you, you said Jesus was Lord. I said it a while ago, but now the rubber's really meeting the road, and we're being tested on whether Jesus really is Lord of all. You know, I remember being in high school. And I was baptized, I was baptized when I was 12 years old, actually. And in Boston, I don't know why exactly, but it was kind of popular back then to get baptized when you were 12 years old. And thank God, God was with me and I've made it this far. But, but by the time I got to high school, I said Jesus was Lord, but now the rubber was really hitting the road for me. I remember being in a car with a, a few girls from my school. We were going to drive off campus to do a project. And one of them asked me, so Jesse, she said, so Jesse, we're all wondering, are you saving sex for marriage? And I thought, wow, that was bold of her to ask me that, you know, in front of, and it was one of those moments where I thought, you know what, here's, here's where it comes to it. Here's where the rubber meets the road for me. You know, I, I either say something else and, and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay at talking to people. I, you know, I, maybe I could say something to, to make a joke. And, but no, no, I said Jesus was Lord. So I told him, yeah, because I'm a Christian. Well, we're all Christians. All right. Well, this is what I read in the Bible. I remember going to my senior prom that year. And, and I'm at the prom, and I'm dancing, I'm trying to have a good time. And, and then this girl came up to me, and she wanted to grind with me. And I am a sheltered kingdom kid. I was, like many of you are, you know. And, and that was a tough moment for me right there. And I remember I, remember I leaned in, and I said, hey, I'm going to dance, but, but I'm not going to dance with you like that. And then I start, you know, she, she was nice to me in the moment. <clears throat> but then, but then I heard her talking about me, you know. She went around and she was kind of talking to people and saying that and, and saying things about me. And, 
And I heard people talk, and did you hear what Goldman said? And, and, and people started persecuting me at my, at my senior prom. You know, I mean, come on, we're, we're at the prom, and, and I'm getting persecuted by these people, and, and they're saying crazy things about me, and, and they're trying to push girls up on me that, that never would have looked at me before, you know? And, and I had to push them away, and I remember it was another one of those moments for me. And I went to the bathroom, and I went into one of the stalls, and I opened my tuxedo up, and I pulled out my pocket Bible. I pulled out my pocket Bible. No water. And I don't exactly remember or know why I put my pocket Bible in my tuxedo, but I guess I thought I might need this at some point tonight. And I read some of my favorite scriptures, and I prayed and I went back out there. We hit moments like this where the rubber meets the road. You're out of the house now. You're on your own. How is it going when the rubber meets the road for you? How is that going for you? You got to choose. At times in life, we got to make that choice. We got to decide. It's easier than you think to go to church, to show up, to do some of the right looking things, but have your heart be somewhere else. You know, I think some of you think, I'm supposed to go to church. I have to. Okay, all right, are we standing up for another song? Is that what it's time for now? I guess, I, I guess maybe I should take my notebook out. It's probably time to take notes now. This is what some of us think. We got college students forgetting to bring their Bibles to church. Come on now. We got college students coming to church with your favorite Starbucks drink in one hand and you pass the plate with the other hand and you don't put anything in there. If that's where your heart is at, how could you ever reach someone else? If this is what the hearts of the disciples in this room are like, how could God ever use us to change the world? Can I talk to the kingdom kids for a minute here? Can I talk to you guys? I'm one too. I grew up in this church. Most of my best friends are also kids who grew up in this church. But I worry. I worry that the kingdom kids in our church, she's going to grow up, she get through the campus ministry, find a beautiful, handsome spouse that they can marry, who's a disciple, and they're just going to build their nice little life together, go on fun trips, visiting all your other friends around the kingdom, because we're blessed in the kingdom in that way, and you're just going to settle into a nice, fun life. If those are your life goals, you're missing it. If those are your life goals, you don't get it. Those were not Peter and John's life goals in this passage. They were inspired. They were bursting with passion and zeal. It was the only thing that mattered to them. I want to tell you about some of the disciples that we have in Boston at Harvard College whose hearts are on fire for Jesus. You know, there was a quiet, quiet little freshman named Elizabeth Quinones who came to, she came to Harvard last year. And she grew up in the Spanish region of our church in Boston. And she went to Harvard and, and Alexandra asked her the first week of school, you want to go share our faith together on campus? She said, yeah. But you know, Elizabeth thought what Alexandra meant by that was why don't the two of us get together and talk about our relationships with God together. And so she showed up thinking that's what was going to happen. But Alexander said, no, what I meant was, why don't we walk around Harvard Yard and talk to strangers about Jesus? That was a little bit different than what she thought it was going to be. You know, Elizabeth, her heart's on fire for Jesus. She said, all right, I'm ready. I've never done it before, but let's do it. So they went out. And that day, they met a girl named Cleanna Crable. And Cleanna's here today because a couple months later, last December, she was baptized. Cleanna, she's a freshman at Harvard College. But you know, the story doesn't end there. 
That night, Cleanna went home and she posted on Facebook about becoming a Christian. I want to read you her Facebook post. She wrote, Today, after months of studying God's word and taking a deeper look at my conceptions of discipleship, faith, repentance, and baptism, I finally made the decision to be baptized and to join the ICOC family. I'm so incredibly thankful and eternally in awe of how God works and how he continues to mold me. It's just entirely beyond words. I was frustrated when I didn't get into my top choices of schools in Chicago, and I was terrified of what I would face when it came to my faith at one of the most liberal intellectual schools in the world. But Lord, you placed me exactly where you planned and challenged me to grow. I'm so grateful to have bumped into Alexander and Elizabeth on the sidewalk one day because I could have never imagined God would have led me to where I am today. I'm so excited to begin this journey with such incredible disciples like the radiant and ridiculously fantastic Alexander Goldman by my side. And I'm so honored to have the chance to live my life for something so much greater than myself. This calling is a radical belief in today's society. Far more so than I ever understood before. But I'm ready to pick up my cross daily and walk continuously as a disciple of Jesus. Regardless of circumstance, I know there's no turning back now that I felt what I feel and I cannot wait to see how I can use what the Lord has given me to bring praise to Him and to show people the love and forgiveness we all have the chance to experience. It might seem stranger than fiction, but it's more real than anything I've ever known. And for that, I can do nothing less than give up my life. Jesus is Lord. That sister's heart is on fire for Jesus. You know, she went home to Michigan over winter break and she drove two hours to go to church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And she started bringing her breast friend, Shauna, with her. They grew up together. They started going to church together. And Shauna studied the Bible. And this past April, Shauna too was baptized. You see that? That's what happens when your heart is on fire for Jesus. That's how the Spirit moves when your heart is on fire. If God can move this way at Harvard, one of the most liberal, elitist, atheistic universities in the world, what could he do through you? What could he do through you? Let's keep reading on to the book of Acts. My second point for you today is boldness or coldness. Are you bold or are you cold on campus? In this past summer, a few of the Bible talk leaders in Boston, we went out to Martha's Vineyard for a little retreat. And a bunch of the brothers decided they wanted to have a belly flop competition. Now, I've never been in one of these before, but it was epic. You know, we were swimming in the pool, and the brothers said, let's stand on the edge of the pool, and let's lock our, our limbs and fall face first into the pool, straight up belly flop, you know? And, and one by one, you know, Jeremy Mintz, he went. Murphy, he went. You know, and all these guys, all these leaders we had, they went and they did it. And then it got around to me, and I did it. But they said, oh, no, no, your leg flinched, bro. Your leg flinched. I was like, no, it didn't. So I got up there and I did it again. Out there and just fall, you fall right, slap down on the pool. And every single time, they kept saying, my leg flinched. And I must have done it like five or six times. But, you know, it's funny. Isn't that what happens when you're on the edge? You know, you can shrink back a little bit. You can flinch a little bit. Let's keep reading on in Acts chapter 4. You know, they tell them, they threaten them. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. But they don't listen. And they say, we're not going to listen to you guys. And they go back and they meet up with the rest of the church. And the church starts praying together. All the brothers and sisters, just like us, they start praying together. Let's pick it up in verse 27. They're praying and they say, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city 
to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God boldly. We're talking about boldness. This is what the disciples were like in the Bible. They were bold. And you keep reading through Acts and over and over and over again. It just keeps saying that, that they preach the word boldly. You want to see how the book of Acts ends? Check out this. This is the very last verse of the book of Acts. The very last thing we hear about Paul. It says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house. And he welcomed all who came to see him. And he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It was a staple in the church, in the book of Acts. I mean, it was in their DNA. They were bold people. Nothing about them was quiet. Nothing about them was cold. Yeah, you know, I think the more courageous and bold you are for God, the more he rains down miracles. Because he sees, they trust me. This person, they don't care what they look like. They put their faith in me. You know, let me tell you about a couple of the student leaders that we have in Boston. I want to show you a picture here of Anthony Pierre-Louis and Josephus Bartua. A couple of the Bible talk leaders we have right here. You can show the picture up there. You know, on, on the right, we got Anthony Pierre-Louis. We call him APL. And on the left, we have Josephus. That's a, that's a spiritual name right there. You know, they were at that pool last summer when we were doing the belly flop competition. But the funny thing is, is neither of them could swim. And... Josephus was hilarious because Josephus wouldn't even let go of the side of the pool, you know. He was holding on to the side of the pool for dear life. He wouldn't go in. And, and one of the other brothers, Mervy, he put his hands underneath him and he floated Josephus around the pool. Kind of like an infant, you know what I mean? He was floating him around the pool and Josephus would get afraid and he would grab the side of the pool. But, but then Anthony, he didn't know how to swim either. And we decided to do this belly flop competition, and he was jumping in the pool anyways. Uh, it, it blew me away. You know, we decided that we were going to go and jump off this bridge into the ocean that was nearby. This is, what, this is what brothers do when they're getting inspired with one another. You know what I mean? And, and so we decided to go out to the ocean, and there's a bridge that's about 20 feet above the water. But Anthony said, I want to come with you guys. And we said, dude, you can't swim. You're going to die. And he said, don't worry, I'll just wear a life jacket. And we said, whatever. Okay, so we go out there, and there's like, there's like a hundred people out there watching people jump into the water, jumping off the bridge. And we get out there, and I was feeling pretty confident. I did a dive off the bridge, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Then Anthony gets up there, and he jumps. He's got his life vest on. I mean, it was, it was awesome. And he jumps, and his jump looked a little awkward. And we were like, what's up with, why does he look like that? He looks a little flat. And, and time slowed down, and we realized this brother is doing a belly flop from 20 feet in the air. And this brother jumped out, whoop, he hit the water. I mean, he came up from the water, and all 100 people standing there started cheering for him. It was incredible. I've seen a lot of great things. I don't know if I've ever seen anything that bold in my whole life right there. Anthony and Josephus, they inspire one another spiritually. This picture that I showed of them, this picture was them at the end of a prayer walk that they did in February. They decided they want to go on a prayer walk to every single college that we have in the city of Boston and pray over every single campus. So they went on a 26-mile prayer walk one Saturday. It took them 13 hours 
praying, singing to God. And you know what? I didn't tell them to do that. I didn't give them that idea. That was their idea. They had granola bars in their backpack and they're walking around singing. We're walking in the light of God. And, and this is at the end of the 13-hour prayer walk. You know, it's no coincidence that God absolutely rained down miracles on these two that week. And there was a guy that Josephus had been studying the Bible with named Samuel. And he was about to get baptized two different times, but then didn't show up to his own baptism. You know, that's never a good thing right there. And miraculously that week, Samuel called us and he said, I'm ready to get baptized. And Samuel was baptized and he's still your brother today back in Boston. That happened that week. You know, Josephus also met a guy named Alaye on campus that week. A Nigerian guy on campus, his name's Alaye. And they started studying the Bible. They studied the Bible for the past few months. And just two weeks ago, Alaye, who was met the week after that prayer walk, he was baptized. You know, Anthony, APL, he leads a Bible talk at kind of a small college. And we were kicking things off that week. And they had 20 visitors at Bible talk that week. Anthony brought 12 men himself to that Bible talk that he had met that week. And Anthony was also studying the Bible with a guy who was really close to getting baptized at that point. And this guy called Anthony that week to tell him, I don't want to study the Bible anymore. I don't want to meet up with you guys. But Anthony convinced him to do it anyways, and he showed up. And me and Anthony and Kevin, we sat and talked with him. And this guy's heart miraculously changed. And he was baptized that week, a brother named Chris. And he's still your brother back in Boston right now. Amen. Guys, it's no coincidence. Do you see what God does? When you do something bold, when you do something crazy and radical for him, he rains down miracles. You know, some of you, you're too careful. You're too cautious. When you're bold, God, he sees what you've done and it shows him you put your faith, you put your security, you put your, you put your life in his hands. God's ready to do miracles through you, but you got to decide, I'm going to be a bold disciple and not a cold disciple. Are you with me? You know, the world is so bold with us. Eh? I mean, you step on campus and sex, it's in your face. Everything, it's, it's in our faces. Partying, drunkenness, it, it's all, it's right there. We got to be the boldest things on campus. Are you with me? We got to be the boldest people on campus. We can't be the quiet, shy, weird, awkward crowd. We got to be the ones who are the most passionate, who are doing the most bold, in-your-face things out there. Because we're the church of God. And we're his family. Because we're Jesus' disciples. Some of you are too careful. You're too cautious with your lives. God, he needs more mighty exploits. We got too many late night 7-Eleven runs and not enough late night prayers, if you know what I'm saying. You know, there's too many Beyonce lyrics being memorized and not enough Bible verses being memorized. We got too much FIFA and not enough fearless evangelism. Y'all make a choice. Now is the time. Any other time, it's too late. Stop being cold. Decide to be a bold disciple. My last point is the power of one purpose. The power of one purpose. See, in the Bible, they had one unified purpose. What's your purpose? What's your dream in life? You know, when I got married to Alexandra, I realized that I talk in my sleep. And I didn't know that about myself before. You know, there was one day, one morning, Alexandra, she put her head on my arm right here, and, and, and out of my mouth, for some reason, came the words, you can kiss my muscles if you'd like. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but we both started laughing like you guys. I, I said, I don't know why I just said that. I don't know where that came from. You know, this is my dream. I'm talking in my sleep. Alexandra says that one day she woke up 
and she heard me say, hello, Church of Christ headquarters. I don't know what that means right there. I guess my true dream and my calling and my true purpose is to be the secretary for our churches. I, I realize that. What's your dreams? What do you dream about? What's your purpose? No one man can change the world by themselves. Nobody can do it. You know, in the Bible, they didn't do it like that. Go to Acts chapter 8. We're going to close it out here. You know, Acts chapter 8, the church, it has not left Jerusalem yet at this point. The church was only in Jerusalem, but then Stephen gets killed and a great persecution breaks out. And we're going to read what happens in the wake of that. Acts 8 verse 1, it says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. But check this out. Verse 4. It says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Do you realize what just happened here? The apostles, they stay in Jerusalem. But everybody else, all the other Christians, they get scattered all over the world. But those who get scattered, all, all the, all the non-leaders, all, all the regular, just Christians in the church, the great brothers and sisters in the church, wherever they go, what do they do? They preach the word boldly wherever they go. You know, it wasn't just the campus ministers doing the work. It wasn't just the Bible talk leaders. It wasn't just the interns who were preaching the word. It was everybody. It was the, the young Christians and the old Christians. It was the introverts and the extroverts. It was the rich and the poor. It was the kingdom kids and the converts. It was everybody. And that's really when you start to see the spirit move mountains. And that's really what happens. You see, you see the spirit, it moves mountains. It parts red seas. When a whole group of people is united in one single purpose. What will it matter if you get the best GPA? If you get your dream job? If you get all the stuff you want to fill your whole big house, but you don't make disciples on your campus. And then you don't make disciples in your job one day. And then in your neighborhood one day. And then even in your retirement home one day. What will all that other stuff matter? I don't care if you want to be a nurse, if you want to be an engineer, if you want to work on Wall Street or for a nonprofit, if you're an athlete or an artist, it doesn't matter who you are. If you go to community college or if you go to the Ivy League, your purpose is to reach everyone. This isn't just the dream of some leader some Bible talk leader, or some, someone who wants to go to the ministry. This was Jesus' dream. And if you're going to be his disciple, it's got to be your dream too. You know, I'm inspired when I hear about what's going on around the country. Anybody here know of a guy named Brian Campbell? Anybody know Brian and Christina? I mean, this brother inspires me. They came and they did our campus retreat in Boston, telling us about all the things going on in Colorado and, and the Rocky Mountains. And I mean, it's, it just inspires me what these two are doing. It inspires me what God is doing there. Yeah, I think about Mike Diacchino. We got any disciples from Cincinnati in the house? You know, I remember when that was a little campus ministry that Mike was on. But now they got like 80 disciples just at University of Cincinnati. That's inspiring stuff. I love hearing that kind of stuff. I mean, Chris is talking about North River. Anybody here from North River? Are you kidding me? What God is doing there. I mean, they got a Bible talk just for the football team over there. I, I mean, it's amazing. Tom, he's one of my best friends. Jordan Massey, that brother inspires me. He leads at Georgia Tech, which is a top university. Very difficult place to convert, I'm sure. You think got like over 50 disciples on campus? 
Just at Georgia Tech? That flat out inspires me. You know why? Why it inspires me is because I love hearing about what other brothers and sisters are doing around the country. Because we need everyone, everywhere, to be united in purpose. You know, a year ago in New England, we talked to the ICMC in New York City. And we talked about how in the past year at that point, there had only been 56 college students that we had helped become Christians in New England. And we were fired up about that, but we thought, you know what? Chris said this whole three to one thing, we need to go for that. And so we made a goal together. All the campus ministers in New England, we want to see 100 college students baptized this next year. And every first of the month, Will Lambert had the idea, we're going to fast together. And we're going to pray together every first of the month for 100 baptisms this year. And I want to tell you that here today, we've seen 91 baptisms since a year ago. So, so what changed? How did we go from having 56 conversions in New England to almost 100 conversions? How did we almost double that? Nothing crazy. We just got united in purpose. We were all on the same mission, praying for the same things, dreaming the same dream. That's the power of one purpose. You know, I want to show you guys something real quick as we close out. I want to show you this right here. You guys don't know what this is, but it's a booklet that's going to be getting circulated this weekend about our movements and our family of churches plan to evangelize the world. You know, four years ago at the Discipleship Summit, I remember hearing some of the evangelists who, who lead our, our church and some of the delegates talking about how we didn't really have a plan anymore. How we need to do that. And they've been working hard the past four years. And it's getting unrolled and unveiled this whole weekend. So keep your eyes and ears out for that. But you know what it means? You know what this means? It means our fellowship has a united purpose again. It means our churches, we have a dream again. And I want to ask you, I want to ask every one of you, what is your role going to be in this? What part are you going to play in this right here? God needs everyone, everywhere. I want to end with a story. Alexander and I, we got married about four years ago. And we went down to the beautiful Gulf Coast of Florida. And we had an incredible honeymoon there. And one day I was, I, I blew up a little inner tube. And I was floating in the surf, you know, right out by the beach. I was just floating in there, just soaking it in, enjoying the vacation and the time. And, and it was awesome. But then a little kid started walking out in front of me on the water. Not on the water, but in the water. <laughs> that would have been an awesome story. And he had floaties on his arms, but he was a little guy. And I wasn't really paying that much attention to him, but I did start to notice that he seemed like he was getting a little far out. And I looked over to the left, and his family was way over there. And so I stood up, and I started walking towards this kid. And his dad started walking towards him. And his dad and I realized at the same time, He's getting swept out to the sea. So I'm looking at the dad. I'm looking at the boy. Trying to figure out, should I go for it or, or not? And, and I'm looking at the dad. And, and he kind of gives me a little head nod. And so I was like, all right. This is my hero moment right here. I start swimming out there. And I'm feeling like David Hasselhoff. I'm going out there. And, and I throw the kid on my shoulders. And, and I did something you're not supposed to do. I swam straight back towards the beach. You're actually supposed to swim along the beach. So I almost killed myself doing this too. But I, I swam straight back towards the beach and I was dead tired. I was gassed. And I gave the kid to his dad and I think he was a little embarrassed. He didn't really thank me. But I just, I was toast. And I remember crawling up onto the beach and going up to my young bride, Alexandra. And I was out of breath and I said, babe, did you see that right there? <laughs> and she looked up and said, see what? I was reading Vogue magazine. And this woman next to us was like, you didn't see that? He saved the kid. It was amazing. And Alexander was like, don't talk to my husband, please. <laughs> the truth is, the truth is, there's not just one 
soul out there in the ocean that needs saving. The ocean is literally filled with millions and millions of people. And we've got to reach every single one of them. Are you with me? Yet some of you are sitting there in the sand or lounging in the surf like I was. And life as a disciple to you is just a day at the beach. And the world is perishing right in front of you. We can reach millions of people in our lifetime. We can reach so many people, but we can't do it unless every one of us is united in that purpose and preaches the word boldly wherever we go. You got to put your hands in. Are you with me? So I got to ask you, are there any disciples in here from LA? Any disciples in here from the Southwest? Guess what? You got to put your hands in. Are you with me? How about from Chicago in the Midwest? How about from Washington and the whole Northwest? You got to put your hands in. Are there any disciples here from New England and from the ACR? You got to put your hands in. You got to put your hands in. And every single disciple needs to put their hands in the plow. And from tomorrow until the day we die, we got to reach everyone. Amen? Amen. 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 My name is Steve Lounsbury. I've been serving in the campus for almost 18 years. And I remember 16 years ago being at the conference in Toronto. And I was a little older than Jesse at the time. And I remember looking out across the, across the campus, and it wasn't this big at that time. And we were wondering who's going to take it to the next level. And we went through some trouble and challenges as a movement. But it's exciting this afternoon to look across this auditorium and to see a young man who was a preteen when I began my campus ministry career get up here and start with a call to all of you to have the heart, a depth of conviction inside of you that will light a fire to move you to stand up for what Jesus stands up for. And certainly you've just heard from a man who is far from cold, but his own examples and his own life and the people around him are bold like lions in the faith. And I hope every one of us will commit, as Jesse called us to, to one purpose. Campus, as he called all of us, we are needed. You are needed. There's lots of works to do. There's great, thing go, there's great stuff going on. Let's be a part of even greater things. Jesse, thank you for preaching the word like a warrior in the campus ministry. Thank you. Tremendous, tremendous job. Amen. How you guys doing? I'm Vince Hawkins. I'm in the Heartland region. We just heard the word preached. Truly, you wrote it on my heart, brother. I was very inspired. Great story. Pocket Bible at prom. Come on, man. I'm loving that. I have a few things, uh, house cleaning things, before we wrap up here, and we're going to close out with our anthem here in just a second. But first, I want to announce the winners of the Holy Smokes thing you did on tag the, you know what I'm saying. Savannah Sipos, S-I-P-O-S. Shamari Wellington. You guys can pick those up at the room she mentioned, all right? <laughs> Did want to mention at 5.30 tonight, we have our service at the Dome. 
It is uh, Hall 6. You just sort of keep walking that way. Every night we'll be at the Dome. Tonight at 5.30, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, of course, at 10 a.m. This is our only main session of the ICMC. It has been awesome, right? Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., our breakout sessions begin over at the Hyatt Regency. You with me? It's all day breakouts. I did want to reiterate that tonight there will be a dance from 8 to 11. That is in Hall 2. There will be concessions and a DJ that we've hired. There's also a comedy show in Hall 3 at 8.30 if you're interested in that. And then I want to mention that tomorrow is at noon, as uh, Malcolm mentioned, there is the one-year challenge uh, at, uh, at noon. The one-year challenge room will be set up, as Jameson mentioned. And then also Friday and Saturday from 11 to 5, the Holy Smokes thing that was mentioned as well. Women will be meeting at 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, men at 11.30 a.m. in the Dome. One quick thing I want to mention to you is that we said this a couple of years ago, but we are in downtown St. Louis. It is awesome. However, do not walk alone downtown. Are you with me? You need to travel in groups at all times. I had to have a little discipling time with my daughter about this as well. You have to walk in groups. You with me? We don't want any incidents. I know you may feel like, oh, I'm going to be okay. It's like walking around in downtown. I'm from this city. Well, listen, that's fine if you're in that city, but you're at the conference, and we want to have a great experience for everyone, and we want you to stay safe. Are you with me? So I don't care what hood you grew up in. You didn't grow up in this hood. You with me? So walk in groups. You with me? If you lose anything, it will be, you can find it in room 109. And um, I think that's it. Tonight, here's what I want to give you a little challenge. Jesse preached a great lesson. Tonight at the 5.30 session, though, I want you to clap so hard. I want you to sing so loud. I want you to amen so much that they are begging you to come down to the floor on Sunday morning. Are you with me? But let's go in there and let's worship God ICMC style. Are you with me? I do want to close with uh, just one thing. You may be wondering, what are we going to be doing next year for the ICMC? Well, we'll all be back together in 2018. That's pretty exciting, right? And then in 2020, we'll have another one of these. But next year, we have two separate conferences. And here's the video. We'll see you guys at 5.30.
There is much to do there. Work on everything. Mark the crowd for help comes. Bring it through the land. Jesus calls the reapers. I'm just at the beat. Ready out the beat. Here are my Lord, here are my friends Because of your goodness 